All right, everybody, thank you for joining us today. I'm Sean Lovano. I'm from Sign Easy, uh, and I'll be your host. If you have questions along the way today, please chat them in. We're recording today's session um, as well. Uh, but look, we're excited you're here. We've been hearing a ton lately about what's going on in, in the growing business community. A lot of trends taking place, a lot of things happening. There's PVP loans, there's applications for it, there's forgiveness, there's uh, what trends are you seeing taking place as part of virtual work? There's adaptations, there's inspirations. We have questions for all of that today. Thanks to all of you guys asking those in advance. So we have slides for those questions, but we're also here to answer any additional. Um, so chat them in, chat them in as they come up and, and, and let's have a good conversation today. Uh, like I said, we are recording today's session. So if you want to have a reference back to it, it's here. Real quick about the companies that are presenting today, not that the companies are, representatives from each are. I'm from Sign Easy. I lead marketing and growth. Uh, we're the e-signature solution for growing businesses. More than 7 million people, um, including entrepreneurs, owners, managers, and teams, keep their businesses moving fast with Sign Easy. You can check it out for free and get going at signeasy.com. We have Aaron today from Stratline. Stratline is a growth-inspired accounting and advisory firm. Stratline understands how quickly things get compl complicated when it comes to running a successful business. So they work with small business owners to provide clarity, data, and advice. With the right tools, every business owner can be happy, successful, and profitable. Learn more about them at stratline.com. We also have Sandeep today from My Startup CFO. Not every startup can afford a CFO, but the investment structuring, equity option allocations, spending, and human resource decisions you make in the early stages of your business can make or break you. If that last sentence made you yawn, you need us more than you thought. Learn more at mystartupcfo.com. And finally, we have Mike Volpe today from Lola Travel. Lola is the number one rated travel management app that lets you save time and money on business travel. Go ahead and calculate your savings at lola.com. And so with that, let's get into today's speakers. I just mentioned where they were from. First today, we have Aaron Andrews. Aaron is the co-founder and chief visionary officer at Stratline. With more than 14 years of experience, Aaron's mission is to pioneer a way for small businesses to make higher profits and reach their greatest potential without spending more time in the office. She's committed to the success of small businesses. She and her team have spent countless hours researching and assisting with PPP business relief loans and will continue to do everything they can to help the community, the business community, through this unprecedented time. We have Mike Volpe today from Lola.com the corporate travel SaaS platform that helps companies stop wasting time and start saving money on their business travel. Previously, Mike was CMO at Cyber Reason, a cybersecurity SaaS company, where he helped the company increase its sales pipeline by 650% in a single year and grow revenue by five times during his tenure. He's also part of the founding team at HubSpot, where he spent eight years growing the company from five people to over 1,000 employees, more than $175 million in revenue, and a successful IPO. We have Sandeep Shroff here today. He has more than 25 years of experience spanning finance, investment analysis, strategic planning, and technology, including the last decade of leadership experience as a CFO in fundraising more than $250 million. He has strategical and tactical financial management experience, and he's worked with dozens of startups from pre-revenue to multi-million dollar revenue. Sandeep has a master's in computer science from Syracuse University and an MBA in finance from the Hayes School of Business, Hayes School of Business sorry, at UC Berkeley. And I'm Sean. I have more than 15 years of experience in helping small businesses grow rapidly. I lead marketing and growth at Sign Easy. And like Sandeep, I'm a fellow Orangeman. That was a lot. So let's get into your questions. Uh, a lot of, lot of overview. So let's get into the questions today. Um, this was mine. I'll, I'll go ahead and volunteer that. Um, and let me, because I think the panel today has a lot of different opinions and happenings on what's happened over the last you know, five or so months for them. So let me, let me ask, how's your business doing? And Aaron, I'll go to you first. How's my business doing? So it's actually doing really well. COVID, when it first came about, um, we were sort of scrambling. It was the middle of tax season for us. We also do taxes. And, but um, we actually, basically when we shut down, I sat our team down, my husband and I, and um, said, uh, we're gonna own this. COVID's, we're gonna come out ahead with COVID and we're gonna do whatever we can to help our clients and the business community the best way that we can. 
And honestly, um, it's been really, really hard. Our team's put in countless hours, but it's probably looking back, it's, it's been probably one of the better experiences. And, and, and I think in the future, in a couple of years, we're going to say that COVID actually put us in a different position, a better position. Um, and our team, our team's amazing. They've developed new skills that they never thought they could. It has been a struggle though, to see other small business owners suffer the way that they have. I mean, we're located in Massachusetts near the Cape. There's a lot of uh, restaurants and stuff like that. So that's been difficult, but it has been really rewarding to be able to try to help them, you know, get through this and give them different tools and then also develop different parts of our business that we've been always wanting to develop that can help businesses further. So overall, our business is doing well. I am nervous about the kind of, you know, unseen future, unknown future, but um, we're taking it and we're owning it and, and we're, we're going to make the best out of it. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good to hear. I've, I've heard that it's uh, been digital transformation and what would normally happen in about 10 years has happened uh, in a period of five months now. So that sounds about right where uh, a lot of a lot of things that got sped up um, that are helpful, but a lot of risks there, too. Yeah. Uh, Mike, what about let's go to another Massachusetts company. Mike, what about yours? Yeah, we're in the travel business and. Um, the travel business has been challenging, right? I think the good part for us is that um, the existing customer base is happy. What we've just seen is like growth completely stopped. So we grew, you know, 10x last year. We were a fast growth company and we were above our plan for this year through January and February. And then through the course of March, things obviously completely changed. Um, so the good part is I think that through all of this, we've seen our existing customers have really appreciated what we do because we made the process of canceling and managing all the travel that they had booked uh, way easier than if we weren't helping them. Um, and then uh, we've just had to really figure out sort of how do you align uh, cost structure with the current growth environment and things like that. And then the really exciting part is it's actually given us an opportunity to take a look at our long-term roadmap and we're building a bunch of stuff that's sort of new and different that I'm really excited about uh, that we'll be launching in the next month or so. And so um, I think that stuff is going to be really exciting. And it's given us an opportunity, again, to kind of think about the, the longer term future and make, give us an opportunity to make some investments that, frankly, would have been hard to make um, just given the fast growth we were on before. Yeah, so let me ask you, like the what we were just talking about with Aaron there, the, the 10 years condensed down quickly. Do you think at some point you would have made those investments anyway, had the company stayed on its growth trajectory? Or is it forced you to kind of rethink uh, how you want to go to market? It's, oh gosh, it's always hard to say. I would have hoped in the next two to three years we would have made them, but it basically gave us an opportunity to look at all the things that our customers had been giving us feedback on and asking about that were not, you know, exactly around travel. It's sort of all the tangential things around spending money and budgeting and expense reporting and all that type of stuff. And, um, and this definitely gave us opportunity to accelerate all that stuff. So probably, I hope we would have gotten to it in two to three years, but it's great that we're finishing it in two to three, two to three months instead. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, we'll go across country then. So we had two Massachusetts people. Uh, let's go across country to California to Sandeep. How's your business doing? Hi, uh, everybody. Uh, our business, you know, much like Aaron's, who's in a similar business, we are in the finance accounting business. So it's uh, it's taken up uh, quite an uptick uh, because, you know, as I tell everybody, you know, regulatory and uh, compliance complexity is a friend of finance and accounting people so that complexity has gone up tremendously uh, it's sad to see some of our clients uh, struggle we are, we are having to go uh, grow much faster than them to help them out uh, we had a crush of demand coming at us because generally you know your work is spread out through uh, spread out uh, spread throughout the month of the year now suddenly we had this massive volume of work that came, the PPP and the forgiveness for us to bring, bring our knowledge uh, up to speed. You know, we help thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs with their companies. We, we work generally with uh, tech companies, generally with uh, VC funded companies. And we are seeing the impact roll through back to us. We, we are clearly uh, 
which is it's clear to us that the impact that is coming to our customers will roll through to us in three to six, maybe nine months, because uh, a, a good chunk of our customers will have are having financial difficulties. We'll have financial difficulties. We're stepping up uh, in how however we can help them you know navigate the PPP forgiveness or other loan programs. Uh, but uh, but yes, you know we've had to grow much faster in terms of skill set, in terms of people over the last few months. Uh, we, we've been a proudly work from home company for the last seven years. Uh, we, we, we mastered the model of you know having accountants work for people worldwide. So I have clients worldwide and I have employees worldwide. Uh, while we thought this work at home will not be a problem, but uh, the other thing was, yeah, I've used to work at home, but my family is not, and I'm not used to having the family around. I'm used to roaming all over the house while talking on the phone. I'm used to talking very loudly on the phone, and suddenly everybody's like, shut up, dad, shut up, Sunday, get back into your room, <laughs> talk softly. So... So that's been a change for me and for all our employees because the families are home. It's a little bit difficult, but uh, but but uh, compared to most other companies, we've we've uh, weathered this thing pretty good. Uh, but as Aaron said, uh, there is darkness ahead, and we will we'll manage that. And uh, you manage things as they come at you. You can't be solving future problems all the time because there are enough problems in the present. And that's what we are doing, solving our present problems and most importantly, solving our clients' present problems. Yeah, I, w I was laughing there for a minute. Uh, my wife yesterday, who runs her own marketing agency out of the house, remote employees, was telling me yesterday that she misses her old life that way. She misses being able to work from any room in the house, from uh, you know, not having uh, kids around or me around or you know, that quiet, I guess, is what she misses. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting comment, both you and Aaron, that it, it's been this, this, this bolstering effect short term. Um, but to your point, nobody's quite sure how this plays out right now. Um, but to your point, you, you have to manage it today. So um, thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Um, let's go into, so what we did today is we got a bunch of questions in from everybody that registered. Again, thank you all for uh, registering and asking your questions. Um, and we bucketed them in these different categories, right? Uh, so we got a handful around the PPP. We got a handful here, as you'll see around the new normal, and then a couple other smaller categories. But we we tried to categorize them the best we could. So let's go through it in this fashion. And again, ask questions as they come up. So um, I'll go to Mike first on this one because we, we started to hint on this, and I, I guess I should have waited. Uh, but has your go-to-market plan shifted? Mike, you there? There we go. Hey, Mike. All right, thank you. Yep. So, um, yeah, we shifted. I mean, we were making a major investment in sales and marketing, um, and we were successful. We were ahead of our plan in January, February, and then uh, we had to pull back because we were faced with an environment where. Uh, talking to someone about buying a travel management solution for their business was no longer an effective thing to be doing. People weren't buying, you know, making new investments in travel in March, April, May. Actually, we started to see an uptick of business in June, uh, but at least for March and April. So we had to make some major changes. We, uh, we did have a round of layoffs, mostly focused on marketing and sales, and we had to kind of right size that part of the business, unfortunately. Um, and then since then, like it's really for us more than a change in go to market. It's really a change in uh, adding to the value prop that we're offering to our customers, which is something that's still underway, but um, something that we need to sort of reposition in order to be able to do. Yeah, no, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Um, how? Let me ask. How quickly did you realize that you're gonna you were gonna need to shift something? Because if I remember back, you know. At least here again, Massachusetts, it's just one big love fest today. Um, it was, I remember schools were canceled for two weeks initially, and they said three weeks, and then it became, we're gonna reassess, and then it was the rest of the year. And like, it was all unfolding very quickly. How, how soon did you know that you needed to start to right size and, and make that shift? So yeah, in some ways, I think we were really lucky because being in travel, it hit 
everything hit quickly and it was really obvious that this was at least in our opinion not going to be a short-term thing and was going to have long-term effects and implications i think if we were in a different business like if we sold software to restaurants i think it would have been a little bit less clear if we sold software to you know other types of folks or we were in you know not in the software business or things like that i think it would have been much less clear so in some ways we were lucky that it was very obvious we were going to be significantly impacted and we needed to make changes very quickly so i remember it was mid-march um, before even schools were out i think i was working from home and we were going after sort of a new strategy and already made a lot of the changes when my kids were still going to school for a few more days um, when we sort of implement a lot of the changes. So in some ways, while travel has been severely impacted, it just made everything so much clearer for us where I know for a lot of other businesses, you know, I'm on a couple other boards and I'm an investor in a few other companies. For a lot of them, even into April, it was, it was less clear what the impact was going to be. So I'd say, you know, one of the, one of the silver linings in this for us is it was very, very clear, very, very quickly that we needed to, um, just be very quick and decisive with what our new strategy was going to be. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for sharing that. I know we talked a little bit about Aaron and Sandeep, so um, we'll let them fill in if, uh, if they want to jump in, but I, I'm going to go on to the next question in the meantime. Um, so this one came in uh, and it was literally just asked this way. I thought it was interesting. Tips for building relationships virtually. Um, so Aaron, do you have anything you'd want to add to this? You've been, I think you've, and I, let me tee this up with another question too, because I think you probably have had to change your go-to-market in the sense of, I know you guys have been very, very focused on PPP loans, which you probably didn't expect. Um, so I, I'll ask you about that. And then also I'm curious, how have you fostered those relationships with everybody being remote now? Um, so yes, we didn't expect the PPP stuff at all. Um, that's part been interesting, but um, fortunately for the past, I want to say seven years, um, we've actually been, you know, using Zoom and promoting Zoom webinar, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, video conferencing with clients and our team um, has been using, we, we just always hop on a video call if we have to talk about something, even if we're in the next office, to be honest. But regarding our clients, I think what was really good and then also not even our clients with prospects and people were just helping, um, it it kind of, it was nice because they could still see our face, um, but they didn't feel pressure to have to come in or the location didn't matter. Uh, I think it actually made the world a lot smaller. Um, and in my industry, I think we're sort of seen as, the accounting industry is like, you have to physically go in and see your accountant. And it was really great for me, to be honest, to be able to just close that gap and make the world smaller for them so that it's okay to do it um, remotely, you can still see us. It's okay. We can still handle your work. And uh, I actually get really helped a lot of clients that were nervous during this time. Um, because even though they couldn't physically come in, they could still, you know, see and help us. And also with our, our colleagues, I actually developed a really, really good relationship with, um, about 12 other accounting firms around the country whom I known before, but, um, we communicated you know, fairly regularly, but this time we actually set up a whole Slack team and I've actually built really amazing relationships with those other accounting firms and we've helped each other through um, this whole kind of insanity with all the PPP stuff, anything related to legislation. That's been amazing. So um, I think just we've gotten clients all over the country because of this and, and just the relationships I built that I probably would never have built before actually really helped. So, and then moving forward, I mean, I'm actually moving out of the state because I can now because our clients and anybody we work with realizes it really doesn't matter where you are. So um, I think it can strengthen them, but in-person stuff still really is nice, but that's probably not going to happen for a while. Yeah. Mike, I actually want to go to you next because I saw something you tweeted the other day and I, I responded to it, which was, um, you know, I think, so I'll leave it to you to tee up, you know, what you were commenting on. But I think one of the things that I have found uh, in this, in the last few months here has been you know, what we know as Zoom fatigue, right? Which is, it's been uh, exhausting to be what we're doing right now. So the irony of it all on Zoom meetings all day, because I think we're not trained to be, to look at a camera like I am right now and literally focus on nothing but that camera, um, which is why I have mine at an angle because 
if you're in a room together, there's a shared experience. It can be assumed that you are uh, participating in the conversation actively, even if you're not looking the person in the eye. But now we have to look and focus on one thing the entire time. It's exhausting. And we have to over emote because it's just like being on TV. If you want to have something perceived as normal activity, you have to go over the top. So talk to me about how you felt about that as a CEO, as somebody trying to keep their business running through this. What have you been doing to build relationships? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really hard. Uh, a lot of the tools that you used to use as a manager, senior manager, CEO are, have really changed. You have certainly some new great tools, but the, a lot of things have really changed. That whole sort of manage by walk, walking around thing where if you had 30 minutes free, you'd walk around the office, look around, maybe grab somebody who looked like they weren't super intently focused on something and talk to them about what they're up to and what's going on bump into somebody in the kitchen who's grabbing a cup of coffee, ask one of those engineers what they're up to. All of those sort of more informal kind of like pop-in conversations, um, you know, don't really exist anymore. Um, I have found that I've spent as much or more time with my direct team. Um, and then that time is gone. Actually, there's a lot more kind of five minute phone calls or quick Slack conversation or, quick, you know, Slack call or Zoom call or whatever it is. Um, so that, that part of it is good, but the like touch with the rest of the company has kind of become like a lot more formal and um, sort of like the, the weekly kind of company meeting and not as much kind of one-to-one. -one. So what I've at least tried to do is kind of randomly pick individual contributors in the company and set up 30 minutes with them um, and just, you know, have a virtual cup of coffee with them and, and try to get more of that activity going. We've started doing like virtual lunch groups. So if you want to grab your lunch, you need a sandwich in front of a screen with five or seven other people. We've got virtual happy hours and those kind of things. It isn't really the same. Um, uh, but I think we're trying to sort of recreate sort of as much of that kind of like impromptu sort of thing. It has pushed me individually to use to just be more willing to kind of reach, reach out and be a little bit more proactive on, you know, Slack, Zoom, you know, whatever the case, email, whatever the case may be. Um, like I'm more likely now to send somebody a quick Slack after I see some new product feature that launched and send a quick, you know, one or two liner to the engineer who worked on it versus in the old world, I'd probably make a note and just like in the next day or two swing by their desk and give them a fist bump. Um, so it's kind of, it's definitely changed a lot of the activity. I'm trying to replace it, but, I don't know that any of us have totally mastered this stuff yet. Uh, there's certainly some benefits to it, but some of the other kind of connections outside of your immediate team are much harder. Yeah, for sure. For sure, that makes sense. Uh, let me switch over to Sandeep, who said he's been, I think for seven years now, he's been fully remote. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you've figured out, Sandeep, how to master <laughs> this a little bit better than the rest of us who've been thrown into it have. What's, what's your advice? Yeah, so I had to say, you're right about the Zoom fatigue and watching that little pinhole camera at the top of your monitor. So, so Zoom and all these video things are relatively new. People have now started using it. Uh, so number one, I've never used video much. And even if I have video calls, I will have a one minute video session uh, with people in the sense that here's my face look i shaved today and i combed my hair and then i switch the video off and i i make all my calls with my eyes closed now as funny as, as silly as that sounds to you guys to me that cuts off all distraction i'm not looking at email no nothing and i'm 100 percent focused on the voice of the person at the other end person or persons uh, because the app, the body language is a big deal, right? I mean, body language tells you more than words do. And in the absence of body language, you're trying to listen to things, uh, the intonations of the voice or any stress in the voice or any questions that are not asked. So to me, uh, having your eyes closed, literally with my head bowed down and you're trying to imagine what the other person is thinking, you're trying to you know, think two steps ahead is extremely important. Uh, and what uh, Mike just said, writing to individual contributors and all that, I've been doing that all along because my, my workforce is literally worldwide, uh, uh, you know, all the way from Australia to, you know, west coast of the U.S. Uh, I can't be there with people. And 
it's very normal for me to just send a quick, we are more a Google Hangout company than Slack. So you just send a quick message saying, hey, that's great. Or a, a client sends a message, we'll forward them a good job or whatever. And uh, that's how we manage the internal staff. And there's one more thing I was going to say. Um, yeah, so the other one, the relationship side, I tend to write a lot to the clients uh, totally on non-accounting things. A lot of our clients are younger entrepreneurs. Uh, this is the first time, especially uh, being a CEO or a founder for them. So I just write a single line email saying, hey, how are you? Hope everything's good. You know, hope you're healthy. If you need anything, let me know. Or if I find an industry article that is relevant to their industry, I'll just send them a link saying, I hope you saw this. There is no sales pitch. There is no accountingness. There is no CFO-ness. There is no technical material in that email. It is just, hi, how are you? That's it. And, you know, probably, go ahead. You're probably going to have, you're probably going to have positive interactions with you as opposed to thinking that you're writing them to worry about cash flow all the time. Yeah, more than that, what I have found, especially the younger people, the first time CEO, uh, CEOs or founders, they're stressed out. It's a lonely job. Being a CEO is a very lonely job. You can't discuss anything. With your, <clears throat> most of the things with employees, there is a political problem or there is information leakage problem or what will people think or how can I tell my, <clears throat> how can I tell my employees that we are in... <clears throat> cash flow trouble or all that. So all of that prevents you from talking to other people within the company. So I can be your, our accountants, our CFOs, our controllers. I encourage everybody in our team. We, we have, obviously we have a large team and I can't interact with every customer, but I tell all my accountants, controllers, CFOs, hey, just write a hello note to them. Um, Remember who's got how many kids or you know, what grades they are in or you know, what was the last time you talked, what was the situation and just say, you know, have a continued, show some respect, show some memory of the client and say hi. That's all. That goes no, a long great. way. Yeah, I think that's good advice. It's a, it, it's a good way to just regularly check in, build a relationship. Right. Um, and uh, good advice overall, since you've been doing this for a while now, clearly uh, successful at it. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, all right, so I think Mike, I'll go to you first on this one, um, just out of curiosity. So what lessons have you learned about building a team after this? Uh, would you stay leaner longer? And I think if I can read the inference there, um, but we can take this whatever way we want, is that to your point, we've, saw, we've witnessed a lot of layoffs. Um, through this. And in tech companies, at least, there was a feeling of, you know, there's the prediction that as long as you're going to keep growing, you hire in rhythm with that. But the second that doesn't happen, you have to adjust. Um, would you, as a CEO now, try to stay leaner longer and, 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 you know, increase production as much as possible with what you have? Or would you continue to go back to that model? I mean, yes, to both. Like, it, this is an, you know, unprecedented it never happened before in the world sort of you know at least the last the is it since the modern technology era like i don't so i don't know that there's a lot anyone would have done to prepare for this unless you had some sort of crystal ball that you knew it was going to happen and so no i don't i don't feel bad about what we did in the growth path we were on because it was working and um, there were certainly aspects of our business that we were working on improving. We were making steady progress toward those. Uh, no, I don't, you know, I think in some ways if you're too sort of risk averse, then um, you're missing out on opportunities as a startup. So it's always a fine line. I don't think, you know, we hadn't gone out and raised like three, $400 million as some of these crazy companies do that are, um, that are still early in their history and sort of, you know, hire 30, 40, 50 sales reps in a month or something. We had leaned into our growth, but I think in an appropriate way. I will say from here forward, I think we are in a different economy. We are in a different place. And we're gonna sort of be a little bit more measured with our investment over time. But I don't know that going back on it, you know, if you, if you didn't have that crystal ball and knew that this was coming, uh, I don't know that I would have played those hands any differently given the information we had at the time. 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, and, and you're right. I mean, things are going well until they're not, right? So you keep building as fast as you can um, until otherwise. Uh, Aaron, do you have something you want to add to this? Sure. Um, we're a small company, um, and the pat, you know, culture is huge for us. I guess, which it should be for any company, really. And I think what we actually lost a couple of employees during this, and it was honestly a good thing um, because they just weren't a good fit for us overall. And we're operating uh, the leanest that we can be right now. But I guess what it really taught us is that that we really, really need to focus in on the, the right people for the company. And, and I also realized that people do change too. I mean, this brought out things in people that I don't think ever would have been brought out um, in under normal circumstances. But um, I think it's gonna be different how we hire uh, moving forward to replace those people. But I do believe that, I mean, my team is sort of maxed out right now and we can't really grow unless we add more people on. Um, but. I definitely have learned some stuff, things I will and will not do again, and most definitely focusing in on the people that fit with our, our company um, a lot more and, and also make decisions about keeping people on. Uh, I'll take a lot more seriously and maybe not take so long to let them go, <laughs> I guess. So Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I wouldn't have expected that as an outcome of this, but that, that is an interesting learning from it. I'll add yeah. one thing, which is we've, we've become a lot more virtual um, and sort of remote first. Um, and I, and we have actually s s thought about changing our hiring criteria. Like it's interesting what you said, Aaron, about sort of changing how you think about, uh, you know, retention and sort of making changes faster. We've started to change our hiring criteria to include a lot more evaluation of written and other types of communication skills that we think are important in this environment. I'm curious, Sandeep, like how do you think about recruiting and like the skills that need that are necessary for an employee to be effective in more of a remote environment. Uh, interesting you say that. Uh, I was about to talk of that. So, so we've been remote from, from day one, as I said, and we don't have any grand strategy. Uh, we don't have any grand strategy uh, of vision, mission. You know, I'm, I'm a very anti-vision, anti-mission person because you know, I can write a one paragraph mission statement. Nobody remembers, it, right? Now, what's the mission statement useful for if you don't know how to, if you can't remember it and you can't implement it? So our vision, vision, mission, execution is just two words. Be nice. Right? And that is all. And I'm not joking. I That is all what I look for when I go to hire people. Are you a nice human being? Because I cannot teach you niceness. Competence I can teach you. It is a little different than, you know, Mike, your engineering hire. If you don't know C++ or you don't know... Uh, uh, any other uh, you know, framework of programming, I can't teach you that. But accounting, if you come with basics, I can bring you up to competence level very, very quickly. I cannot change your attitude to life. So the be nice part, so all our interviewing process, uh, hiring process is configured to figure out the person's attitude and chemistry. Because that is more important to us than your accounting competence. We have an extensive training program internally. Uh, we put you through that. Of course, you have to have some basics, but I don't expect you to be a full-blown accountant to our standards. And then we've hired hundreds of people like that. Uh, and the two things that we do, uh, one on customer side and one on uh, uh, employee side, we don't pay any agency to find people or customers for us. We have no sales and marketing budget from sales and marketing department. And we have no uh, recruiters working for us. Uh, we believe that, you know, word of mouth has worked fine for us to grow to the level where we are. Organic growth has been pretty good for us. Uh, because that attitude is so important, both on customer side and employee side, that whatever we early attempts we made in the early years of the company, we found they were the wrong kind of employees, the wrong kind of customers. And we are, we are, we are a very mission-focused company. We are actually hiring mothers, who are working from home. They had just had kids and they were forced into leaving their jobs and there is an economic hit to the family. There is a, you know, uh, intellectual and a professional hit to the mother because she's now having to be at home. So we are bringing work back to them at home so that they can work in flexible hours, you know, flexible location and everything. So for that, the, having the right attitude is more important than anything else. And we've grown all this while, you know, 
we literally have families of people working with us, both on the customer side and on the employee side. You know, we'll have, you know, two sisters working for us, a brother, sister working for us. We even have a father, son working for us. On the employee side, I will start with the husband's company and soon I have the wife's company and then the wife's father's company because, you know, they, they sync uh, and they empathize with our mission and they understand the quality of work we bring in. And, and that's how we've grown. Uh, so, so we've always been very lean. We hire just in time. But again, that attitude is the most important thing for me uh, other uh, than even than the competence part. Yeah, I think that's good advice. I will take uh, issue with my accounting teacher will tell you that you cannot teach accounting to anybody, mostly me. Um, I, I can bring the nice though. I can bring the nice. Uh, all right. So a couple more questions that we got a bunch of more to get through. Um, and maybe we were just covering this a little bit, which was, are you willing, are you more willing to have a remote team now? I think we kind of just talked about some of that. So I'm going to jump over that one. What's this one could be interesting because we can interpret this a bunch of ways. What's one key learning that you've had from your business during this time? Mike, you want to jump in? Um, I think maybe the key thing is just how resilient teams and companies really can be. I think that you're always a little bit afraid as a leader of, oh, if something goes bad, is everything going to spiral out of control? If, you know, if we miss this goal or miss that or whatever. And if you do the right things and you're building the right team and you have um, a team that believes in you and believes in the mission and believes in each other, you can endure far more hardship than you think. And um, I think that that's been one really fun and great learning. And I think that the team as a whole is really proud of what we've been able to accomplish in the past couple months as part of that. But that, that really knowing how much resiliency you have, I think is um, kind of a key learning for me. Yeah, that's great. How about you, Aaron or Sandeep? Sandeep, anything to add here? You can change faster than you think you can. Yeah, especially when you're forced to. Exactly. This thing is just forcing us into what I call fast evolution. Aaron, anything you'd add? Um, I guess also for us, it was um, surprising how much we my team learned from this and grew dramatically just in their roles. And then I think uh, just ownership and, 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 and I guess support of the company in general and our clients. So um, even though it was a really, really hard time for us and it was extremely stressful and I didn't always, you know, I tried to, you know, you try to keep your cool as much as you can, but um, sometimes when you think the business on the line, it's not as easy, but my, our team was so supportive and they learned so much and they're actually a lot more confident now coming out of it. So, um, yeah, I think we just actually got, I, I'm surprised of how much better we are at the other side of it because we didn't expect it. And then we just owned it and went with it. Uh, that's great to hear. Um, yeah. So I think in the interest of time, I think we're going to jump ahead to some of the PPP questions here. And if we have time, we can come back. I think there's a couple left in this section. Um, there's four left in that section. So we'll come back, but I want to just kind of jump and change topics here quickly. So we got a bunch of questions on PPP. Um, here in the States, obviously, this has been a very uh, ambiguous or rapidly changing topic. Um, so let's let's start going through some of the questions that came in and we'll get you answers that we have. So this one's a very specific one first. And Aaron, I'll throw it over to you. Um, I have a small business with no employees, real estate broker for more than 35 years. Um, they've had a downturn. Are they eligible for a PPP loan? Yeah, so um, yes, but it depends. So actually a, a couple of these questions, it all depends. It depends on the entity type that you are. So if you're a uh, single member LLC um, or a sole proprietor, like Schedule C, solopreneur, we will call it, uh, yes, you can, but there's, it depends on your 2019 net income. If um, you're talking about no employees, but you're on payroll, because perhaps you're an S Corp uh, or maybe a C Corp, which would be kind of bizarre, but um, then it also depends on the payroll in 2019, your payroll figures. So there's a lot that goes into it, but um, Assuming you, ha if you're a, a you know sole proprietor, 
and you had net income, you didn't have a loss, you know, taxable income line 31 on your um, tax return for 2019, then you can apply for it and you're limited to the amount of the net income for 2019. And then payroll, if you happen to be an S corp and you're on payroll as the owner, it's limited. You it's based on your wages for um, that period. There's a, a bunch of other things that go into it in a calculation. So yes, but it depends. <laughs> if that helps. It does, like I said, this is an ambiguous area. So thanks for yes. trying to clarify it. Um, We'll stay with you for a minute. Uh, can you go over owner pay guidelines from the new EZ form? Yes. So the owner pay guidelines for the EZ form or the um, the standard, the full form, are the same. Um, again, so again, it depends on the entity type that you are. If you're a Schedule C, a sole proprietor, um, the owner pay guidelines. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about forgiveness and like what you can pay yourself. It's actually um, very, very good if you're a sole proprietor and you don't have payroll on the side. So whatever you basically got in 2009 for your PPP loan amount, it was probably based on your 2019 net income. Um, you just take draws from the company and then um, it's, there's a couple calculations depending if you're choosing the eight week period and the 24 week period. But um, basically almost the entire amount can be forgiven up to 15,385 if you choose the eight week period or $20,833 if you choose a 24 week period. Um, there's other things that go into it. If you're an S Corp or a C Corp, there's different rules. So if you're an S Corp, um, this also goes for Schedule C's too, but if you, let's say you have two companies that you got the PPP through. So I actually have two entities and I got two PPP loans. If you're the owner of both, meaning um, the shareholder more than, and you can only, you're limited to the amount of money that you can be paid or for the amount of forgiveness over the two entity types to that 15,385 over eight weeks or 20,833. And it's also limited by the amount that you took cash compensation during 2019. So uh, if you took no payroll as an S Corp owner in 2019, for some reason it happens all the time, it's you're really not in compliance with tax rules, but if you, if you didn't take, um, Paycheck in 2019 as an S Corp owner, you're actually not supposed to take, um, you're basically not supposed to be compensated for the most part for the PPP and get forgiveness from it. Uh, if you do, and it was less than the, those, the limits, the, it's basically if you paid, if you were paid $100,000 in 2019 through payroll, if you divide that by 52, multiply it by um, 2.5, then that's the amount of money the max you're allowed to take over one corp or two, two of your entities. Um, so it's, it's not as clear as you'd like it to be. Um, they, they also limited it um, for owners for the 24 week period. You can't like take that eight week period of the, and average it out over um, the 24 weeks because they didn't want owners to have quote unquote windfall from the PPP. Um, so again, it's, it's not as cut and dry as you'd like, but um, I hope that helps answer a question about it. <laughs> yeah, apparently we should have asked a whole lot of clarifying questions within this. What kind of a corporation are you? Did you take yeah, any No, yeah, so that's a lot of the questions, but that's okay. I get to give both answers. So. <laughs> um, all right, so maybe Aaron and Sandeep, if you want to jump in here at all on some of these two, um, and Mike, if you're feeling frisky. Um, what's the most recent update on PPP loan forgiveness? Does it seem like it's going to be blanket forgiveness? I think this is one of those things, again, you hear something different every week, but where do we stand? So um, Mnuchin has actually, a few days ago last week, announced that he believes that um, blanket forgiveness should be given uh, for loans up to $150,000 for businesses that took up to $150,000. Actually, 86% of the loans that were given um, were for businesses that had under $150,000 PPP loans, which but it only accounted for 26% of the funds that were given out. Um, the other thing that's pushing back are the banks. The banks, this is going to take hours upon hours of processing for the banks. They basically have to rewrite the loans during the forgiveness to process them. So they're really, really, really pushing hard to just have blanket forgiveness for under $150,000 just for um, that reason, the administrative reasons. And also for business owners, that they make it sound like the application is extremely simple, but it's really not. 
Um, it's going to take a long time and they want to push it because they don't want business owners spending more money on trying to get forgiveness and assistance with that. And, um, you know, they should be focusing on their businesses. So I hope they pass it. Um, the banks are pretty powerful as we know, so maybe they will. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, Good. Go ahead. One thing to add if I'm, I don't know if I'm unmute. Yes. So, uh, but even if the blanket goes through the 150 plus, 150k plus loans will still require the uh, application for forgiveness. And as most of you probably know, the forgiveness period has been extended from eight weeks to 24 weeks, extending as late as uh, December 31, 2020. So basically you got two and a half months of pre-COVID payroll as PPP, and now you have till December to spend it. So if you if you're not laid off, People, if you've not reduced salaries, you should be able to get full forgiveness uh, purely on payroll basis. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for jumping in there with that, Cindy. All right, another one. So we actually have the corporate structure here. My company is a two member LLC that does not have a standard payroll system. Can I still get a PPP loan? Um, me take this? Go for it, Aaron. Okay, Aaron, so go I did, yeah, sorry. You can do it. No, no, you go, you go. Okay. So um, two member LLC, yes, it also, it, they, they do have an entity in there, but we don't know if they've elect S corp status. I'm going to go ahead and assume not. And they file a partnership tax return. Uh, so yes, they can. Um, if you're just doing a strict partnership tax return, you don't take payroll under that. They have to look at your K one net earnings um, and then uh, take out depreciation and oil and gas depletions and something else. Um, so yes, you can, if you're a, uh, two member LLC that is elected S corp, then it's based on your payroll again. So um, let's say you're a combo and you have a two member LLC that is a partnership. You do not take payroll as the owners, but you actually have staff that does that you have employees that do that's on payroll. So what you would do is you take your net earnings for 2019. And then, um, then you'd also add in the gross payroll totals for your staff, your employees that you pay through payroll and that would calculate the loan amount. Andy? Got it. And the, so and the thing to remember, payroll as uh, PPP applications are open till August 8th. Yes. The, yes. The, even the deadline for loans has been extended. Yes. And there's still $120 billion left to be spent, I believe, the last time I looked. Yeah, right, right. Still a lot and uh, still time. So mm -hmm. yeah, these are good questions. I was actually surprised. We got a couple of questions. I think one of them coming up, like this one, uh, that People are still unsure if they apply, if they can apply for it. So this is the question now. How do I know if the PPP is right for me? Rhyming unintentional. Are there other programs I should be aware of? Sandy, do you want to do this one? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure there's one answer to the question. If PPP is a loan which is forgivable, uh, I don't know of any other program where the loan is forgivable. There is this thing called the EIDL, uh, Emergency Something Development Loan, whatever on the full form, but that is definitely a loan only and not forgivable. There is another thing coming up from the government which is not approved yet, I believe, called MSLP, Main Street Loan Program. That again will be loan program, meaning it is returnable. So PPP is the only one which is forgivable to any extent. So I think that itself is the decision point for you right there. You know, essentially, it's the if your business has been hurt and you meet the criteria. Uh, there is no reason not to take the PPP. I agree. And I think the EIDL, um, I think the, the requirements, um, the rules under spending the funds of the EIDL are still very restrictive and are under, um, it's an emerg like an economic injury disaster loan. So it's really geared around something like a hurricane right now, my understanding. And um, I believe they're going to change some of the stipulations of spending the money. But right now, if you get an EIDL loan, um, it's actually a, a pretty good loan. It's 30 years at, I think, 3.75% interest, which most businesses can't really qualify for a fine, uh, commercial loan. But if you have it, you, you as an owner, you can't take draws while you have the loan. Um, you can spend it on payroll and costs and other costs, but there's, you're very restricted under owner, like for so some businesses that rely on owner draws, that's extremely restrictive. Uh, you're, you're supposed to buy American made products if possible, things like that. So. The IDL could be a really good option, um, but it also be aware of what your 
you're getting, I guess. And payments don't start for the first 12 months. So maybe you could take it and hold on to it and then um, make a decision after. And an easy EIDL, I think, uh, Aaron, you're talking about and which I was talking about is uh, subject to a max of 150 k Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. More than that, you have to get into very complicated application. The simple one is 150K. Yes, and people just, um, the EIDL, that what we're talking about, people, some people call the IDL, is also part of that advanced, like that grant people talked about in the beginning, up to $10,000. That's when you applied for that, that EIDL advanced slash grant, you automatically were applied for the loan portion as well. So a lot of people got emails um, like a month or so ago saying that their loan was there and they could go, um, accept it or choose the amount other people got letters or emails saying they were denied but you even if you got the grant you don't have to accept the loan itself but remember if you did get the grant it will reduce the forgiveness portion of your people the amount of the grant that you received so just throw yep, that in there that's correct yeah good advice uh, while we're here i think it was actually on the previous slide we got this question so i figured i'd throw it out to uh, sandeep and aaron now question is i own 100 percent of an llc but we file as an escort. I haven't paid myself on payroll in 2019. What is the max amount that I can get with PVP? Zero. So because, they, because they had not paid themselves on payroll. So so if they played employees in 2000, they had to. Have, so when they when you do the forgiveness application, they had um, two periods you could look at. You could look at 2019 calendar year or like a fiscal year of April 1st, 2019 to March 31st, 2020. And you could use those periods to calculate payroll. Um, but so if you have 2019, you had employees on payroll. Yes, you could apply for it. But if you didn't pay yourself during that time period in 2019 only, then you can't take a paycheck and be, have it be forgiven uh, right now. So, so they also allowed you if you had a new business as of before, you know, it started before February 15th, 2020. Um, and it put it, but it, started after january 1st they don't address that at all for compensation for owners either or so so that's sort of just that was just sort of like thrown out i think not really thought about but um basically if you didn't take payroll in 2019 and you're an s-corp you're you're kind of sol okay thanks for sharing that and thanks for answering that on the fly here um is there a service that assists with these loans um well we do it but I will, what I did want to bring up during this is that um, the SBA hasn't actually um, issued that they don't have a portal available. They actually don't have a system yet ready to accept the loans, the, um, the, the forgiveness applications. So we do have some clients that are chomping at the bit to get these applications submitted. Uh, some banks are, are saying that they have, they, you can submit your, your forgiveness application. Um, everything I've been reading and my, you know, my accounting gang, I talk to all the time, they don't submit, wait, because you're going to have to most likely redo it. They're probably going to change like, you know, the blanket forgiveness thing for under $150,000. So they don't even anticipate the portal being available uh, open until I think mid August at the earliest. So um, like we're offering the service, I'm sure Sandeep is for helping out with the um, forgiveness applications. Um, or the loan itself, but um, I would I would sit tight and just wait, and then once you do submit it in, you have they have sixty days to review, and then the SBA has sixty days to review. So yeah, so the problem is, guys, that we have we have a forgiveness applications ready to go. The banks are not accepting them because they have sixty days to make a decision, and they don't know if they can do it within sixty days or not. So for the fear of uh, running afoul of the authorities, they are just telling us, "I'm not taking your application." Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just sit tight. Nothing works <laughs> fast with the government. <laughs> yeah. This this whole program kind of did, but now it's now it's not. All right, I want to close out with this one, um, seeing as we have, I think, just a few minutes left. So let's get this last inspiring one. Uh, Mike, you've been quiet. I'm going to go to you first. What's giving you hope? Um, I mean, there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. The economy has not completely collapsed. And if you're adaptable and resilient, there's a lot of places where you can go and build a business and earn some money. And if a travel company can figure out a way to have hope and build toward the future and be signing up new customers and be about to launch a new product, then I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there for all sorts of folks. I know it's in some industries, it's been 
a positive thing. Like a lot of uh, companies are actually doing better. A lot of industries have certainly been hit hard and I have personally felt that pain. Um, but if you're creative, entrepreneurial and resilient, there's opportunities out there. And so uh, that's given me and I think our team a lot of hope. Yeah, a travel company that doesn't have a whole lot of money tied up in planes, right? That's probably the key there too. But yeah, good stuff. Uh, I've been impressed with that too, how resilient companies have been throughout this. Uh, Aaron, what about you? Sorry, I can get on. Um, what's giving me hope? Um, pretty much the same idea, actually, as Mike. It's been really fun to see some of our clients and other businesses um, pivot, I guess the word is, for marketing um, and create new forms of uh, services or products. Um, I mean, there's some businesses that took off that had were just like hobby companies that I've spoken to recently that are very interesting. Um, so I just, I think it's, there's always good things that come out of um, crisis. I guess war brings about tons of new inventions. I think something like this is very similar. Um, so I'm interested to see how it goes. And I, I think a lot of really cool products will come out and um, just also my team, too it just made us and our clients too just made us realize how, how good we have it with our team and our clients and yeah that. my 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 two cents my two cents on this is very non-technical i'm an observer of humanity i like to work uh, observe human beings and what gives me hope is the just sheer generosity of people towards each other whether that is paying your service providers or you know, being nice to somebody else or helping out neighbors or whatever. I mean, this generosity and you know, people's niceness has come out in ways unimaginable before. So that is what gives me hope. We are still human. Yeah, somebody once said, I think to unite the whole human race, it'd have to be aliens coming down and, and attacking us in order for everybody to work together. But this has been pretty close. <laughs> it's been pretty close, I think, uh, to doing that. Um, all right, well, thank you all. I really appreciate you guys' time. Um, really appreciate the attendees who uh, put up with yet another Zoom. Um, hopefully this answered everybody's questions. If you still have them, fire them in, email in response to the invite, um, and we'll get you answers for them. Um, but hopefully everybody has a great rest of the day. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with us, and uh, take care. All right, thanks everybody. Bye.